The purpose of this series is to provide an overview of select vintage and modern games, their pros and their cons, and what are the essential books and items that you need to play them. With different editions, multiple games appearing to be similar on the surface, and a huge variety of supplements and expansions, newcomers, and even some veterans, can often find it daunting and confusing place to be. This series hopes to lend a helping hand. On today's foray, we are going to jump into the first game developed by one of the most prolific luminaries of the gaming industry, with Ogre, created by Steve Jackson, the American one. First, let us clear something up with a potted history of the two Steve Jacksons of gaming fame. Because this is something that especially British newcomers and relative newcomers that have heard the name may still find confusing. Steve Jackson, the British one, began his gaming career as a journalist, freelancing for Games and Puzzles magazine. In 1975, along with his school friends Ian Livingstone and John Peake, he founded a company that primarily focused on producing crafted boards for games such as Backgammon. Peake was a craftsman. They published Owl and Weasel, a newsletter mainly written by Jackson about gaming. They named this company Games Workshop, which you may have heard of. Anyway, long story short, when Jackson and Livingstone became aware of games such as Dungeons & Dragons, they changed the direction of the company, causing Peak to leave. Owl and Weasel morphed into White Dwarf, and an important chapter in the development of the British gaming scene was formed. Right, so that's Steve Jackson, the British one. Steve Jackson, the American one, who is the real subject of our video essay here, graduated from Rice University in 1974. After that, he briefly attended law school, but left to follow his passion for games. Initially, he found work with Metagaming Concepts from 1976 as a games developer working on games such as Monsters, Monsters and God's Fire. It should be noted here that the game developer is not the same role as game designer, much as in the video game industry today, designers are the creators of the game's concepts and themes, while developers take those and make them work. In the case of Monsters Monsters, for example, which we touched on briefly in our Tunnels and Trolls video, the game was designed by Ken St. Andre and Jim Bear Peters, and developed by Steve Jackson. From there, Jackson received his first design credit in 1977, with the publication of Ogre. Within the late 1970s and early 1980s, small box games were reasonably popular. These were called micro games or pocket games or a variety of variations upon those themes. The basis was simple. An entire game contained within a small box or a Ziploc bag of about 4 inches by 7 inches, usually suitable for one or two players with a reasonably short playing time. Notables amongst this style of games, from my perspective, include Car Wars, Star Smuggler, Barbarian, an edition of the awful green things, and of course, Ogre. Ogre was Metagaming's microgame number one. The Ogre game was further expanded by GEV, microgame 8, in 1978, which was a standalone game which built on both the rules and the background of the Ogre game. However, things were not going swimmingly for Jackson at Metagaming. He had been working on a fantasy role-playing game, The Fantasy Trip, which built on two previous Jackson games, Melee, Microgame 3, and Wizard, Microgame 6. Jackson had underestimated how much work would be needed to bring the game to fruition, and The Fantasy Trip missed its original advertised release date of February 1978, by quite a bit. Two years, in fact. The game was finally released in 1980. Jackson had originally intended the game to be released as a box, but Metagaming decided to instead release it as four separate books. Not only that, the company changed production processes, effectively stopping Jackson from reviewing the final proofs for the game. This disagreement led to Jackson leaving Metagaming and founding his own company, Steve Jackson Games, in 1980. As with most cases of such splits within the creative sphere, things were not cut and dried, at least not as far as Ogre was concerned. The first game that Steve Jackson Games released was Raid on Iran, which did really well, after which followed One Page Bulge. And here the split got messy. Metagaming sued Jackson for the rights to One Page Bulge, 
and this wasn't resolved until 1981. However, the result of the lawsuit left Steve Jackson Games owning the rights to not only One Page Bulge, but also Ogre and GEV. With two editions of Ogre published by Metagaming, Steve Jackson Games set about publishing their own third edition of the game, which arrived in 1982, along with a third edition of GEV. Battlesuit, dealing with man-to-man combats within the universe of Ogre, arrived in 1983 after originally appearing in The Space Gamer in that same year. Ogre and GEV saw further expansions with the release of the Ogre Book in 1982, Shockwave in 1984, Ogre Reinforcements in 1987 and Ogre Miniatures in 1992, a variant that broke Ogre away from its Hex and Counter foundation. Ogre and GEV were published in a combined set in 1990, with a revised version of that combined Ogre GEV game coming out in 1995. The fourth edition of Ogre came in 1997, with Deluxe Ogre and Deluxe Ogre Miniatures arriving in 2000. Leading in from this new revision of Ogre also came new editions of Ogre Reinforcements, Ogre GEV and Shockwave in 2000, with Deluxe GEV arriving in 2001. Further modular maps and scenarios for them came in the form of Ogre Battlefields in 2001, along with an updated edition of the Ogre Book. The Ogre Miniatures rules were revised in 2008, available only as a PDF product, but the grandest edition of Ogre was on the horizon. As a celebration of Ogre's 35th anniversary, Steve Jackson Games launched a Kickstarter to produce the Ogre Designers Edition in 2011. This was a massive product and project, with a large board reproduction of the Ogre and GV maps, with cardboard models representing command posts, towers, turrets and ogres, and a large number of counters. The goal for the game was set to $20,000, but nearly reached a million dollars by its close. Weighing in at over £20, this edition was shipped to backers in 2013. A reworked pocket edition was also released alongside this monster. What's more, the designer's edition includes rules for all ogre and GV units, but without the GEV name appearing on the box. Additionally, the size of the game was increased from about three quarters of an inch to about one and a half inches, effectively quadrupling the size of the maps. From the back of the designer's edition, Steve Jackson Games further developed the game, resulting in sixth edition being released in 2016. This contained similar models and counters to the designer's edition, except in far smaller quantities, with far fewer units being described. A revised Ogre Reinforcements added more counters and units to both 6th and Designer's editions. Ogre Miniatures was revised in 2018 with the Battle Box. This is a standalone version of 6th edition which features plastic models in place of counters for major units such as tanks, GVs and, of course, Ogres. All of the Battle Box's components are compatible with both the Designer's and 6th edition, with some overlap. Ogre Battlefields, another Steve Jackson Kickstarter, ran across 2018 and 2019, bringing even more maps and counters to the larger scale started with the Designer's Edition. And finally, in 2019, through yet another Kickstarter, Steve Jackson Games reproduced a number of classic pocket box games, including Ogre, GV, Battlesuit, Shockwave and Reinforcements. All of these fall into the third edition Ogre bracket being reproductions of those game sets rather than new products compatible with designers and 6th edition scale. We'll round out the history off by noting that Steve Jackson continue to sell and are continuing to develop materials for Ogre, particularly in PDF form. There are Ogre t-shirts, dice, badges and shot glasses. There should be a hat. There is a video game and an app to assist tracking tabletop battles. Ogazine collecting fan-made articles and funded via Kickstarter, has had two editions so far, and the Ogre universe has been fleshed out somewhat for role-playing with GURPS Ogre, published in 2000 and still available in PDF form. The future history of Ogre continues to unfold. Ogre and its related games is a hex and counter wargame. The basic game of Ogre, specifically, is an asymmetric wargame, 
That is, the opposing forces do not possess similar balanced pool of units to select their forces from. Instead, one player plays the Ogre, a gigantic AI robotic tank, and the other player plays the forces of conventional armour attempting to halt its progress. Conventional units have a simple set of statistics. Defence, attack, range and movement. Variation to these statistics is provided for different unit types. For example, ground effect vehicles, GVs, get a double move to reflect their speed and their hit and run tactical use. Advanced units may have additional weapons, such as anti-personnel weaponry, and capabilities such as capacity for carrying infantry. Ogres are the daddies of the future battlefields, represented by the game. They are so massive and fortified that they require separate record sheets to note damage to various components and subsequent decrease in combat effectiveness. In its basic form, which is the default scenario for Ogre versus conventional forces on the cratered landscape represented by the core Ogre map, one player controls an Ogre and the other player controls a force attempting to defend a command centre from the Ogre's attacks. Mob attacks are the order of the day, with the results of combat being determined by a ratio of attack versus defence strength. The higher the ratio in favour of the attacking units, the better the results may be for them. Conventional units are destroyed by successful hits. They don't record specific damage. A unit can be temporarily disabled, but that's as far as record keeping there goes, and it's easily managed by flipping the unit's counter over. Ogres, on the other hand, record damage to its weaponry, as well as ammunition for certain weapons, such as missile launchers, and damage to its motive systems, its treads. An ogre's effectiveness is obviously reduced by destroying its weapons. Destroying treads slows the thing down, ultimately rendering the ogre unable to move. The game continues until either the ogre has completed its mission or the defending force has prevented it from doing so by disabling or destroying it. To this basic form of the game are added terrain in the form of modifiers and additional maps, more complex units such as marines and APCs, and a variety of scenario components including building complexes to attack, trains, mobile targets and so on. With all of these in combination, scenarios of a wide degree of complexity can be created, without the core simplicity of the rules getting in the way. In fact, Ogre belongs to that select group of games that are simple, but with a broad range of tactical and strategic options. Often, wargame rules can get bogged down with unnecessary minutiae and complexities which hamper play to the point where the, it is the rules, not the players, that dictate the course of battle. The old wargames research group rules suffered from this. Conversely, too much simplification can often lead to results being largely decided by dice than the players. Games Workshop's Warhammer rules suffer from this to a certain extent. While combat is ultimately resolved by dice within Ogre, there are a lot of options available to players to affect their odds of success without overly complicating the game. This does make it an ideal introduction to board wargaming. The ratio mechanic used by Ogre is also used in a number of games from Steve Jackson. While the games themselves differ, this common similarity in their combat resolution side of things does make them easier to learn. Games such as One Page Bulge and Necromancer follow this line. Different games, different scopes and objectives, very different tactics, but a familiar peg to begin from. For review purposes, I'm going to take the classic game, in this case 3rd edition, and the current edition of the game, 6th, plus a general nod towards expansions for each. I'm also going to consider Ogre and GEV as parts of a whole, rather than separate games in their own right. And we'll review Classic first. Classic Ogre is neatly carried in a pocket box, and uses a half inch, about 13mm, counters. With the base game, you get enough counters to keep you going for a good while. By adding GEV and Shockwave, you end up with a lot of counters, that you can perform almost any Ogre universe scenario you want to. The map is marked out in hexes, and the counters fit neatly into them. The game's rules are clear and concise, in a short pamphlet the same size as the box. It is easily learned and referenced. The expansion rulebooks follow a, a related numbering of rules, so it's often very easy to find the rule that you need to reference for a given situation. So, for the game's pros, 
It is easily transportable, simple to learn, and takes up very little space on the table. On the con side, the half-inch counters leave little room for clear unit identification marks. A silhouette of the unit is used, which is not always clear, definitely not at a glance. Text is also used, but very small. Perhaps a conventional marking system could have resolved this. Units from different sides are very clear, using black, white and grey backgrounds. For the base game, the ogre player's counters are black and the opposing force counters are white. With the expansions in place, the rules are a little more complex, but not by much. Specialised units are added, which add options and variety to scenarios. Counter storage does get a little wacky, but cheap compartment boxes of about the same size as a pocket box are handy in this regard. The game is fast, fun, compact and easy. So, now on to its more recent big brother. Ogre Sixth uses hexes of one and a half inches, about 38 millimetres. Counters are hex in general shape, truncated on their upper sides to a point that reflects relative size. Counters representing larger units fill more of a hex. Ogres are depicted using 3D models, which take up two hexes. This looks impressive in the game, but the ogre itself actually only occupies the front hex of the model. This can get annoying when playing. It's a little bit of a fiddle when units move up directly behind the ogre. On the whole, though, it is a nice touch. With more space per counter to be had, unit identification is easy. Units are depicted top-down, and counters also carry a clear text label. Units from different size are identified by different colour backgrounds and different unit colours. For example, the base units are blue on a white background for one side and red on a black background for the other. In the Ogre 6 box, you get enough counters to play the basic game and a lot of variant scenarios. If you add in reinforcements, miniatures, on which, by the way, the Ogre Battle Box is a complete game, you don't need Ogre 6 to play it, but the two complement each other, and the other expansions, then you gain more maps and counters to play with, in a similar way to the expansions for Classic Ogre. With the designer's edition, you get everything you need to keep you busy with Ogre for many, many moons. Maps, counters, 3D ogres, and even more counters, representing both units and modifications to map terrain, are overflowing in this set. It is a monster. So, for the pros, the counters are easy to reference, and the glossy rulebooks are clear and make learning the game very easy. For the cons, the game has one big one. And that is that it is big. The maps have the same layout as the classic game, but require nearly 10 times the space to uh, set even the basic game's map down. It is not portable, and it requires a good deal of space to set up. A hidden pro to the game is that the hexes and the Ogre 6th edition boards are roughly the same size as the Battletech map sheet hexes, so you can use them with a game of Battletech, and Battletech's map sheets can be used to throw Ogres around on. All in all, Ogre, both Classic and Sixth, are good-looking, easy-to-learn and play games, with an interesting premise and a lot of fun. The only essential is the Ogre Basic game, which you can get by picking up a copy of Classic Ogre, second-hand or reprint, the Ogre 6th Edition Box, or the Ogre Battle Box. From there, the Ogre Scenarios book, either as three separate volumes or together in one compiled volume, are a good addition, which expand the scope of the scenarios possible with the game, hopefully firing your imaginations to think up your own. The Ogre book isn't essential, but it is an interesting read if you get into the game and its background. If you want a more expansive game, then for the classic game, pick up GEV first, then Shockwave and Reinforcement Packs later, if you, heaven forbid, start running out of counters or some such. If you get the Designer's Edition, there's really not much more to add. Some different counters here and there with expansions and so on, but well, how much more beast do you want your beast to be?
Steve Jackson Games has a long history of producing innovative and fun games, of which Ogre was one of the first and one of the best. There's nothing much more munchkin than throwing an AI robotic tank weighing over a thousand tonnes that is armed to the gills onto a nuclear bombed-out wasteland of a battlefield, after all.